Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul welcomes back his longtime friend, J.P. Sears. Many of you will know J.P. as a stand-up comedian who also posts funny and thought-provoking videos online that have been viewed more than 500 million times. What you may not know is that J.P. was a student with the Czech Institute nearly two decades ago. He became one of the Czech faculty and coached clients from the Czech Institute's facility in San Diego, as well as working out with Paul and being cajoled into performing exercises for photo shoots for various articles, books and manuals. Nowadays, JP is an online phenomenon and he takes an unapologetic stand for freedom, free speech and encouraging people to free themselves from fear. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast. Your opinions matter and your ratings help us to grow and help more people to be healthy, find freedom of body and mind and to live their dreams. We hope you enjoy this episode with Paul and J.P. Sears, entitled The Jester's Wisdom. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, we're going to speak about the Jester's Wisdom, and there's nobody that knows more about Jester's Wisdom than my buddy J.P. Sears. I don't think J.P. needs much of an introduction, unless you live somewhere where there's not even a cell phone handy. So, J.P., always great to spend time with you, bud. Yeah, uh, same. I mean, I'm just thinking we've been spending time together for the past 21 years now. Is it 21 years? Wow. Yeah, I we you know, we first met in person. I had just turned 20 years old. I was studying your stuff for a couple of years before that. So I just turned 20 and I'm 41 now. I'm wow. older than you were, a couple of years older than you were when we met. You were <laughs> twice my how's age. It, how's it feel? <laughs> It, it feels good. Like I feel, oddly enough, I feel younger than I did when I was 20. And I think part yeah. of that's the state of mind and yeah. hopefully I'm physically healthier as well. So yeah, I think it feels great. I think aging is a beautiful thing as long as you control your biological age as you chronologically age. So yeah, life experience, it builds actual wisdom, which makes life a much more enjoyable ride. So yeah, it does. Yeah. I remember, uh, my 42nd birthday, we were in the, uh, gym at, at the, in the Vista location. And I remember on my birthday, I did 42 rock climbers chin ups. That was my way of saying I'm not dead yet. (laughs) (laughs) Just to prove to yourself you're still alive. Yeah, actually, I I was at my peak strength around 42. And 42, according to research, is when a man reaches his peak potential because he has the perfect combination of enough life experience to have wisdom and enough youth to have the energy and the physical ability to still get things done. So you're really right at the prime of your life right now. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well... I'm going to take advantage of it. That's for sure. Well, I think you have been. <laughs> you certainly, <laughs> you certainly been busy. Yeah, you know, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to be 61 this month, so I'm like starting to say, "Wow, I'm really getting older." Because I keep having students tell me, "Oh, I took classes from you when I was in, you know, Los Angeles Chiropractic College, and I've been in practice for 12 years, and my daughter's in going to college now, and I'm like, oh, for Christ's sakes, don't say that. Well, you've been around for a hot minute, my friend, Uh, but (laughs) yeah, uh, yeah, you've done so much for so many people, and you've had some years doing it to impact a lot of people than for them to go out and have an impact for years on their own, so. Yeah, it's kind of fun. And you're young. 61. And August 23rd is your 24th. Yeah. 24th. I was, yeah. I identify that as correct. Yeah. You're close, pretty close. Right? You got 24th. So uh, it's fun to be able to talk to you. I've, you know, been watching all that you're doing, and you and I stay in touch through text messages and whenever we can chat. But, you know, we're both super busy, so we don't drag each other down with constant itch and scratch, but I always feel like you're in my heart and I always love watching your videos. Um, 
what have you been up to since COVID kicked off and how has your life changed? Um, and, uh, add, add to that, how's your new home and land? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I'm having a great reset. Um, I think Klaus <laughs> the real is, one. <laughs> yeah, man. I, it, as much as the whole pandemic of COVID is rooted in corruption and what I would call straight up evil, to me, there's always blessings with the curse. So I'm simultaneously against the agenda. Uh, I'm very grateful for COVID. I've uh, I've s- matured into a new clear mission, and in a word, that mission is freedom. So you know, once COVID hit, I started realizing like, oh, freedom's my number one value. I didn't know that before because, you know, a fish doesn't really know it's swimming in water until you take it out of the water. You start taking away freedoms and you know about patterns of history and know like, well, that's where it's going to go. Yeah. Um, let's not do that. <laughs> let's not, it for sure. So, you know, I've, I've really felt on, I, I think I felt on purpose for a lot of my adult life, but there's just, a, you know, upper echelon of purpose I've stepped into since COVID hit. So I'm, you know, my content now is pretty much all derived around helping awaken people to protect and preserve and celebrate the greatest God given gift I think we could ever be given, which is freedom. So I've been busy at that. And, and, you know, as you mentioned, uh, what was it? Six weeks ago, we moved into our, new place just outside of Austin, Texas. We're on a 13 acre ranch now, which is just, well, a variation of freedom. There's so much space and land and, you know, starting to take more control and self-responsibility for our food and water and well-being. So feels good, yeah, it, doesn't it? it? It feels really good. You know, I, I think I heard you say a long time ago, health is self-responsibility and you can just keep extrapolating that like self, like self-responsibility. It's a never ending spectrum. And I think the higher up we go in self-responsibility, the better it is. Um, and, and that's not to justify disconnection and isolation, just not talking about that, but Self-responsibility, it feels good. I think it truly is a superpower for people. And I think we're living in an age where, uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, the newer generation is being influenced by propaganda that tries to talk them out of the superpower of self-responsibility and tries to make the responsibility for their emotional well-being, their life, their food, their water. They try to you know, outsource that to someone else's responsibility, but self-responsibility, it, it, it truly is empowering. And I think it can feel uncomfortable anytime a person steps into a new level of self-responsibility, but newsflash, usually what's uncomfortable is pretty fucking good for you. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, as you, as you know, the whole tyranny of it all can, wind the warrior up in you. And I certainly have had my moments of that. And I think, you know, from our exchanges, since all this went down, both of us were like, no fucking way is this going down. And I'm not going to stand by and watch this shit and, and not say anything about it. So probably almost every podcast I've done, I'm banging the drum of don't play stupid games. You know, I tell people, if a law or a mandate is unlawful, then it's criminal to follow it. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you're, you're an accomplice to crime when you're, when you're doing that. And I think when you look at what's going on across the board, I mean, when I was a young man as a paratrooper, I would have felt it my absolute duty to, participate in the removal of a threat. I I swore an oath to protect the United States against foreign and domestic enemies. 
And so I'm watching all this shit go down, and, and it's been a real wild spiritual growth process because the, the youthful man in me, the soldier in me, is irritated as hell. It's a real spiritual tight walk, tight tightrope walk for me, or a fire walk, and I have to constantly ask myself, who are you? Who, who have you come to the world to be? What do you want to exemplify to people? And part of it is, is that what keeps ringing through my head is the Bhagavad Gita. Have you read the Bhagavad Gita? No, uh, not in its entirety, just little passages here and there. Well, you know, it's the story of Krishna and Arjuna. And Krishna, of course, is the Hindu god or a Hindu god, but he represents God. And Arjuna is this warrior. And he, the story is he's with Krishna in the battlefield, but Arjuna realizes that many of his family members are on the other side and he's got to go to war against a lot of his family and he doesn't want to fight. And so it's the story of. Krishna saying, don't you realize this is all just a big play? It's just God having fun. And you've got to fight. You know, you, that's, that's what life is about. Get into it, you know. And, 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 and so it's this kind of like deep, it's, it's probably the most read of the Hindu scriptures. But it really shows you these polarities in life and how we have to face these really tough decisions in life. And so it's, it's the story of Krishna really trying to enlighten him that this is how God experiences itself and that this is not something you can run from. And if you do run from it, it's just going to show up somewhere else in your life and you'll just face it in another way. Yeah. And so it's, it's a deep story of the real challenges of life. And and I'm watching all this, but, but I'll, I'll share with you, I got to a point about a year into this where I was starting to get so irritated that the military was just playing dead. And when I saw the Pfizer contract, I don't know if you know about this, but they actually went, signed contracts with all the countries that did it that gave them complete access to the, all their militaries, their runways, their airports. Really? Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I watched a, a, a podcast that was video, and the guy's actually holding the documents up and reading the deal. I'm like, how, who, what kind of government could ever even come close to signing agreement? Like, I'm realizing that this is like they've bought people off all the way to the top, right through the government. I've even had, uh, I watched an interview with a one lady who said she got so irritated she started investigating and she found even the mayor of her own town, which was some small town, I think it was in uh, somewhere in the United States. It might have been Canada, but it was it was in the United States. And she's like, it's a little town. And she goes, she says she started investigating the mayor of her town. She found out that you know the guy's living in a huge ass mansion. He's driving expensive cars, but like the mayor's salary for that town is probably only 50,000 bucks a year. And she's like, all of a sudden this guy's very rich. You know? So the point is she, she, and she was an investigative reporter. So she started looking into this and deeper and deeper. And she found that this was going on in little towns all over the place. Mm. And then I watched a, an interview. It was called the town hall meeting. And one of the guys in there was a higher up from the Christian church. And he was one of the speakers to organize people of how to manage themselves through all this. And he said something that about made me shit myself. He said, you may not realize this, but the government gave every Christian church in the United States $5 million to keep their doors closed through the pandemic. And he said, now, look at how many of them took the money and closed their doors and pushed their flocks out to follow these mandates. And he says, the question I have for you, was it for safety against some virus or was it because they got $5 million? And I don't, he gave the percentage, it was like 97 or something percentage of Christian churches took the fucking money. And I'm like, okay, 
we're dealing with a lot of corruption here, and you got to have a shitload of money to pay all these churches $5 million, and that unfortunately really highlights the warning I've been giving people my whole career about what I call corporate religion. There's a saying I teach all of my students. The pain is seldom where the actual problem is. For example, I've seen many cases of rotator cuff problems that wouldn't heal even after surgery. But what most doctors and therapists overlook is that the right shoulder is under influence from the liver and the left shoulder the stomach. Once we apply the principles of detoxification, support digestion, and clear parasites, presto, shoulders start healing and working beautifully again. If you learn to see people holistically, like I teach my students in Holistic Lifestyle Coaching Level 1, you begin to see the true source of our illnesses and injuries. HLC 1 teaches you many essential approaches to health and well-being, such as how to assess what key body systems are under too much stress and how to restore balance, the importance of identifying a realistic dream goal or objective that inspires each individual to stick to their healing program and make the short and long-term changes that are necessary, my universally applicable 1234 formula for assessing and correcting challenges, how to breathe optimally to enhance energy levels and mental clarity, how to use gentle movements to work in and enhance life force energy and support optimal immune function, how the function and health of the soil that food is grown in influences all systems of the body, including our mental-emotional stability, and much more. HLC1 is just a small part of what we teach our Czech Academy students, our education system for elite trainers and health professionals. Gavin Jennings and I designed the academy to take you from wherever you are right now, even if you have no fitness or health education, to being one of the best holistic health and performance professionals on this planet. And as a Czech Academy student, you'll be able to help a lot of people reach their health goals in ways you never imagined. There is, in my opinion, nothing more rewarding and meaningful in life than helping other people look, feel, and live better. We are now accepting applications into the Czech Academy, so whether you're wanting to change your career or add a truly effective new dimension to your current skill set, now is the time to apply. Go to chekinstitute.com forward slash L number 4D Academy. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash L4D Academy. Let's make the world a better place together. I won't mention names for for security reasons, but you you will know who I'm talking about. You know, there's been a lot of Navy SEALs come through my training program. And one of them in particular was very high level active for a long time. You probably remember who I'm talking about. I believe so, so yeah. I reached out and said to him, I, I had to be careful what I said because I suspected he might be watched. I said, why... Are your bro- why are your brothers not taking the garbage out? And his response broke my heart. He said, Paul, the real soldiers you're talking about have all been bought off by the political elite. They don't exist anymore. He said, the only real soldiers left use their own money at great risk to go rescue people from Afghanistan. Yeah. And they don't have the resources to do what you're talking about. And he was explaining to me how sad it is for him to sit and watch. But I, I realized that this is like, this is a plan that's gone very long, very deep, has a lot of people involved, a lot of money involved. And it is not as simple as just a drug company um, messing with people and doing the typical shit. I mean, as you well know, this is a very, very well orchestrated. It's probably the most organized crime ever to be out in the mainstream, yet no one's fucking doing much about it. I mean, not nobody, of course. You're doing something about it. RFK's doing stuff about it. I mean, you we we all know who the people are that are doing about it, but you're 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 it's kind of like um we're a bunch of guys with pea shooters and we're up against uh, a, um, uh, a militia that's backed by trillions of dollars. I mean, it's yeah. kind of like, okay. But, you know, th- th- that said, like you, I keep having to remind myself, because I moved into our new place here right when this whole thing kicked off. And we've had 
over two years of the best life we've ever had. And the funny thing is, is that sales at the Institute for things like my HLC one online course and videos went through the roof. I mean, like, I'm like watching people go into lockdown, lose their jobs, and, and my bank accounts are going up, which was good because when we moved in here, we had all sorts of surprises and had to spend shitloads of money. And I'm like, I'm going to go broke right here, right now. But all of a sudden, I would get a check for podcast commissions and just my my little commission on some of the sales. And, and it was a big check. And I'm like, thank the Lord, because I'd be like going around asking if I could weed people's gardens to tie ends together here. But so the point is like you, it's been a miracle because I've not only have we been living, but we said, okay, it's, it's showtime. We have got to get fully self-sustainable. So we have our own water. We have solar. We planted over a hundred trees, fruit and nut trees. We built big gardens. We got our pond and, and we're now stocking it up with trout. We've got a pig. We've got chickens. We're going to uh, get either some goats or uh, some llamas, but we're basically pretty close now to where no matter what happens, we'll have our own power, our own water, and our own food. And and that process alone, which I might have been a lot more lackadaisical about if I didn't have this realization that it's time to like prepare for the worst, has been as you surely must have experienced when you have your own land and your own place, there's a calming inside. There's a, a sense of home that's it's safe. It, it really is. And <clears throat> I, I say to my wife pretty often, I'm like, you, if we never have to rely on what we have as far as our own food, water, and, and hopefully we never have to rely on it. Um, is a big question mark, but even if we never have to, like we have just enhanced the quality of our lives that we, we wouldn't have done nearly this much if we didn't have the motivation to do so from these evil tyrants that are, you know, trying to control humanity. And, and you mentioned you took an oath to you protect this country against foreign and domestic terrorists and just turn on the news and you see domestic terrorists. Look at the Oval Office. You see domestic terrorists. It's right, like, uh, right in front of us, right in our yeah. own backyard. And they, and they, and they have the same citizenship and driver's licenses. And they're walking around in the fucking street and everybody's just acting like nothing's going on. Yeah. It's like, guys, that's the domestic terrorist. It couldn't be more obvious. And I think part of, how they get away with it, I mean, it's, there's so much that goes into that, obviously, but they're hiding in plain sight. So the the average person says, well, dude, like Bill Gates wouldn't be saying he's going to reduce the va- the population with vaccines. Like you took that wrong. Like he wouldn't just say that out loud if that's what he really wanted to do. So it's just hidden in plain sight. And, and I, I think you started to touch on this. Without a like a spiritual understanding and context, it it's very easy to lose one's sanity with what's going on. But I I mentioned some of the the blessings of the curses that are happening now, and one of the silver lining blessings is you know kind of like the it's almost cliche at this point we're either living through the great reset or the great awakening, and I see so many people waking up like the more. Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Fauci, puppet Biden, the more they talk, the more it wakes people up because there's deliberate lies, gaslighting, corruption. And I think it 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 serves as a great spiritual catalyst for people of reminding people what they are not. So I think it motivates I've I've seen so many people grow. I think myself included, so many people grow as a person these past two years more than to a greater degree than any other period of my life. And I, I think the evil that is so 
blatant in this world is the catalyst for the growth. It's kind of like throw shit in the garden. Well, the shit, it's kind of shitty by itself, but it's growing some beautiful things. So, you know, when I think about like, dude, why aren't like the people that have sworn to protect the country against foreign and domestic terrorists, I understand, you know, like you shared with the Navy SEAL, why they can't just take these people out. And and maybe it's better that they don't because humanity is growing and waking up. And obviously with humanity growing and waking up, some of the old infrastructures of deception that were parts of the matrix, some of those are going to fall away. And, and that can be hard times for people. Um, that's why self-responsibility and being a decentralized person can be helpful during this time because, you know, burning away the scar tissue that doesn't serve us anymore, if we rely on that scar tissue, that'll be a painful experience. Yeah, you know, the other thing too, and I, I know you're likely to agree with me, and that is, I've said to people many times, look, if if they put Gates, Fauci, Soros, and crew in jail, and it just went back to business as usual, we probably have 10 years, 20 at max, before we have a major environmental collapse anyhow. So the kind of the flip side of this whole thing is it's really brought, I mean, I just taught a workshop this last weekend uh, on how to build water charge. I had 45 people in there. And during the introductions, I kid you not, JP, at least 15 of them said, I'm starting my own farm or my own healing resort where I can have my own food, my own water. I'm like, wow, like this is 45 people. And a third of them to a half of them are all buying land or have already bought it and are already building. And students of mine in the, in the Institute all over the world have already gone and built healing retreats and farms and places like that before even COVID happened. So I think, I think all of this is bringing people into more of an awareness, not only of COVID, but what's going on in the world. And it's giving us a chance to realize that we have to really carefully look at how we use fossil fuels. We've got to look at how we use education. We've got to look at how we trust or don't trust medicine. We've got to look at the government. We've got to look at the banking and financial system. It's forcing people to get off their asses and, and get involved in, in this. And, and not to mention, as you know, there must have been 10,000 lawsuits by now, most of which have been won by people that challenge the system. So, so you know, it's, it's, it's actually got some really... Um, invigorating, uh, positive awakening effects. And, you know, I, I, of course, because of my relationship with you, I, I just like, I'm practically got a Woody here watching your videos. I'm like, <laughs> fucking hey, go JP. You know, I, I mean, you, you've got a far bigger platform than I do now. So when I see one of your videos go out, I know, okay, that's a message I couldn't have said it any better. And he's reaching a lot more people than I am. So hella fucking Luya, but I got to give it to you. And, you know, I put it in there to talk to you about some of this, you know, you're, it, what's it feel like for you? Because you're definitely walking a tight rope. Yeah. It feels like freedom to speak my mind. <laughs> yeah. It, to be honest with you, like, um, you know, early on in COVID when I started, speaking up on behalf of truth, calling out lies and corruption of the tyrants. You know, there was a point where I realized pretty quickly the like, oh, like this could whatever get me deplatformed and it could lose all the online stuff. And at the time, so much of my business was tied into having to be online. But I looked at that like cool, like the the idea of speaking my truth but being at risk or dampering the truth and keeping the security of staying online i looked at it and said fuck it like there's no choice here i am absolutely willing to risk losing everything in the name of being aligned by truth and 
you know, becoming a father that, that made me realize I would rather pick up cans on the side of a highway to have to feed my family than to censor myself, sell out, play it safe, and not be as effective as I could in creating the world that my son deserves to live in. And, and I think there's so much peace of mind that comes with being willing to lose quote unquote everything. Because here's the, the truth that I've realized everything that you can lose doesn't matter. All you can lose is the material shit stuff status, all of which does fuck all for your fulfillment. It it gets you dopamine hits. You get excited when you reach a new level of stuff, but it doesn't matter. No family, your children being on purpose, serving a mission greater than yourself. Yeah. That's what can never be taken away. So I, I think there's a saying, it goes something like, um, when you're willing to risk losing everything, the paradox is you have everything. And when you're, when you're willing to risk losing nothing, then you've got nothing. You've got nothing. And Jung says no man is fully alive until he has the power to destroy himself. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I think we all have the power to destroy ourselves. You can destroy yourself today by saying yes when you should be saying no. Yeah. Right? You can, you can destroy yourself by not paying attention to what school your kids are going to and sh- having them show up with their head all fucked up, which is going on like crazy. I mean, I, I was watching a video as a sidestep here of a woman who, she's a mother, and she was like in a full-on battle with the school board, but she went to the library at the school. This is like kids in like fourth grade or fifth grade, and she goes to the school and she's finding these hardcore porn books and nasty shit in the library. I'm like, what the fuck? Who puts that shit in a library for kids? I'm like, like this is going on all over the place. I'm like, what's going through the minds of these people? I'm, I just was watching a video of the Senate voting on whether or not we should refer to the people that have babies as women or something else. I'm like, okay, we're spending our tax dollars. And fortunately, all 50 uh, of the senators or whatever in the House voted to call them women. But I had to crack up because one of the representatives from Florida got up and he said, I just did a survey. (laughs) For the last 5,500 years, only women have had babies. So I (laughs) vote that we keep women as the ones yeah. having babies. But I'm like looking at this going, what, what do we got going on here? I mean, we're talking, we're using the highest powers of government to vote on the dumbest shit on the planet and trying to decide who has babies. I'm like, this is dumber than fucking dumb. There's not even words for this. Yeah, well, it, to me, it, it's dumb, certainly, but it's it's more than that. It's evil. I, I look at the like trying to destroy objective truth. That's Marxism. That's the spearhead of communism. And the idea that in this country, an elected official would even be proposing, like, should we change the name of what we call women who give birth to me that it it sounds like good. We're looking to be inclusive and, Cutting through that bullshit, it's evil. It's an attempt to destroy objective truth. And if you destroy object, would, you know, can never be destroyed, but you can destroy people's awareness about objective truth. And when you get people disconnected from truth, then you control them. But if they're connected to truth, truth controls them. Their own conscience controls them. So the idea that, you know, I, I looked at something about the, uh, this got leaked out from Portland Public Schools, their gender ideology curriculum for kindergartners, what? fifth and sixth grade. They're they're teaching them like you know, a, a boy isn't someone with a penis. A girl. That's just some people think so, but they're wrong. And it just had all this Marxist horse shit, 
which again, it's packaged to be good, inclusive. We want to be nice, but evil can have a smile on its face. If you're destroying objective truth, what you're really trying to do is control the minds of the people you're trying to disconnect from the truth. So with five-year-olds, they're doing this. It's just incredible. Hi, everybody. I'm sure you've heard me talk about the many injuries I've had doing many wild things from racing motocross to riding in the rodeo and crashing stock cars and being a paratrooper. And one of the things that's really helped me a lot to make my joints more comfortable and heal is collagen. And Bioptimizers has just come out with an amazing new product called Collagenius that actually goes way beyond anything we can get in the standard collagen supplementation classification. And I've got Mark Effinger here, who's the chief product officer at Bioptimizers, to tell us about their new product, which I'm very excited about. Mark, tell us what's unique about Collagenius. Well, thanks, Paul. Um, I, and I really appreciate this, by the way. So Collagenius came about um, as an accident of my lab assistant trying to compartmentalize different mushroom extracts from one to one all the way to a hundred to one. These are all medicinal mushrooms and they're all organic. And we were finding this really interesting overtone of chocolate and cacao coming out of these mushroom extracts. And the more extraction we got, the further we got down the extraction lane, the higher the, the chocolate notes would come out of these. So me being a, a, a more of a scientist, I was trying to cap these things. She being more of an incredible chef decided that what if we could flavor these up and us both being over 50 and me having some of the same experiences you have in breaking bones and tearing muscles and tendons <laughs> decided, wouldn't it be great if we could, if we could take the, the benefits of collagen and the restorative and, and tissue repair and combine it with these micronutrients that are available in mushrooms that activate the collagen and make it bioavailable. So we started blending those things up. And as a result, we came up with this nootropic, this brain enhancing mushroom stack that is also a super collagen enhancer. And those together became Collagenius. That's so amazing. I just love the exploration. I love the marriage of your wife's chef skills and your science skills. And that's just the magic of a healthy relationship. And that really describes my relationship with Bioptimizer. It's just magical because I love all their products. I, I've always had a great relationship with Wade, and I love it because everything by Optimizers sells actually works. What a concept. So, hey, you guys, get your Collagenius at N-O-O-T-O-P-I-A, that's newtopia.com forward slash living number four and the letter D. That's newtopia.com forward slash living four D, and get your discount with Paul 10 on checkout. I can't wait to hear what you think about Collagenius. Enjoy. You know, you've probably heard me say this before, but I'll say it again because it makes a very important point directly related to what you just said. I often ask my students when it comes to truth, this question, how much piss can I put in your beer before you won't drink it? Yeah, about one drop. Right. Be, my point is, a glass of beer is a glass of beer, and when you add piss in it, it's not beer anymore. And the beer represents the truth. We all know that the male-female differentiation is part of the divine plan, or everything in the whole dam of nature wouldn't be sexed, except for a few androgynous insects that have both parts within them, but they're certainly the minority. But, you know, it's really the whole psyop of it all and the fact that that so many people, you know, this it's sad to say uh, Angie and Penny took the kids to Disneyland a couple months ago. Yikes. Yeah, and when they came back, I said, so how is Disneyland? And they both like looked at me and said, Paul, you wouldn't believe the people. The level of obesity is unbelievable. And there's so many people that you could not tell if there were males or females. You just couldn't tell. And, you know, do you remember Pottinger's cat study? Yeah. Do you remember what happened to the cats in the third generation of eating cooked food and pasteurized milk? 
I believe that was the de- generation they couldn't reproduce anymore. And they lost their sexual preference. The males started having sex with males and the females with females. They lost their sexual preference. And the cats, when, he, when they would throw them in the air, they couldn't land on their feet anymore. You know, you know, we all know a cat's cool because you can throw it up in the air, spin it in the air, and it always lands on its feet. But yeah. Pottinger found if you threw the cats up in the air, they just land on their heads. They'd lost their writing reflexes, their sexual orientation. Now, here's the paradox. That was done by doing nothing but cooking the meat and pasteurizing the milk. Well, we've got like 68,000 chemicals in the food supply that don't belong there and a long list of other shit. So if you look at this from strictly a nutritional perspective, and you look at what Pottinger's cat study showed, we're in, we're, our, your children and my, my little ones, you know, Paul Jr. is going to be 43 this September, but Mana and Zoe are the fourth generation since we begin what Pottinger would call processing food like that. And we're watching the complete breakdown, which not only does it parallel Pottinger's cats, but back in like 1949 or whenever that book was published. And this is interesting. I don't know if you remember in the back of the book, it shows a picture of a naked boy and a naked girl facing like a blackboard. And they're in a, it's, they were in a hall full of doctors having a meeting and Pottinger was doing this. And I think it was a photograph that he had taken, but he then asked the doctors to please tell him which of these is a male and which is a female. And the doctors could not tell. And this was taken in 1949. Okay. So think of what's happened since then. Yeah. The, the Pottinger's cats was what's happening today. That's a, a shocking yet accurate what we're seeing with kids, teenagers, children today. But one thing that Pottinger's cats didn't have was processed psychological thought going into them through TV, propaganda, social media, where you you just think, well, those cats degenerated simply off of poor nutrition alone. So we've got poor nutrition with Physically, emotionally, and mentally, and spiritually. Absolutely. So now you throw the fucking human cat in the air, it lands on its back, but says, I identify as landing on my feet. So fuck yeah. off. <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Oh. And I'm sure it's my feet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it, oh my God. But, you know, there's a couple things that rise up in me because I'm talking to you. Um, one, you know, I spent a good five years of intensive study of Osho. And one of the things that Osho said that I've never forgotten, freedom is the most dangerous thing you'll ever experience. I mean, when you really meditate on that and say, okay, JP, what are the things people like you and I do in the privacy of our own space that if we were to go out in public and say, this is my sexual preference, or this is my, the way I like to use plant medicines or, you know, almost anything. And I'm not even talking about weird kinky shit. I'm just talking about stuff that, because we're not in the consensus norm, you know, people that live true to their heart and soul and say, I'm going to make love to my wife, however she wants and we want, or I'm going to eat this food or, you know, like a lot of people attack me because I became a vegetarian for a year or because I wore Tai Chi pants or whatever the fuck. I mean, you, you know, the, the, you know, the, the point is, is that we've got such homogenous ideas, whether they be religious ideas or social ideas that the, the matrix of the average person's life is so constricted that if you don't wear, I mean, when George Bush passed this law, George Bush Jr., 
which after 911, I saw the list that they use when you go through airports because I was always getting in trouble in airports. I remember the stories. <laughs> yes. Um, but I actually saw the list of who could be identified as a ter- potential terrorist at which time you lose all your constitutional rights. They can torture you. They can put you in prison. They don't have to give you a phone call. And it was including things like if you're wearing sandals, if you do not have a collared shirt on, if you wear your hat in any position other than the straightforward position, if you have shirts or pants with holes in them, if you have open-toed shoes, if you're wearing uh, what I think it was blue jeans or any other kinds of clothes that like they basically made it. So so literally anyone, anyone can be labeled as a potential terrorist and you lose your rights. And this shit's getting worse and worse. So what am I saying? Freedom is the most dangerous thing you'll ever experience because the minute you live free, you leave the consensus norm. And now you are different than people. And People have a problem with people that are different. And you see that in all the gender bashing and all the religious bashing and all the uh, ethnocentric or uh, racial stuff. And my response to that is, I have a question for you that think this stuff is good. Do you like Mexican food? Do you, have you ever had Jamaican jerk chicken? Have you ever noticed that the music you listen to is made by musicians from around the world? And what would it be like if you only ate American food, listened to American music, and you never had the opportunity to see the art, the poetry, the music? Have you ever noticed that many of the actors that you're watching on television come from other countries? And did you ever notice that the United States is a melting pot of people from around the world And it is the diversity of all the things we bring to each other, whether they be the wild, crazy people of the world, the musicians of the world. We give each other the joy of difference. And and this whole thing is about wiping difference out. They're trying to turn us into fucking zombie robots. And I'm saying... You should celebrate the uniqueness of who you are, and you should not let go of that. And I hear Osho's voice in my head, freedom is the most dangerous thing you'll ever experience. But if you aren't walking on the edge of a little danger to be yourself, then who are you? Yeah. Where are you? What are you? Yeah, and and I would add... Uh, a, a thought and question to Osho's quote, you know, of freedom is the most dangerous thing you can experience. And maybe that danger of freedom is the safest thing you can ever experience where, you know, a, another way to look at it is giving up your freedom is the most dangerous thing you will ever experience. You'll have the illusion of safety and protection, but guess what? you you don't have your life and that that is the true danger you don't have sovereignty of your mind you don't have sovereignty of your actions while that can feel safe i would dare say maybe that's the true danger but being willing to feel the danger of freedom maybe that's safety i mean, maybe a true safety like self self preservation versus self realization self realization would say Uh, The danger of freedom is true safety and self-preservation was like, fuck that. That's danger. Danger feels bad. So it's bad for me. And, you know, uh, my friend, Tim Kennedy, he's a special forces soldier. He always says, you look at the world today, you've got two choices, dangerous freedom or peaceful slavery. Yeah, that's too true. And speaking that there's two things that I want to share. One I felt the most alive. Here's the times I felt the most alive. Watching my children be born. That was intense. That was that was beyond words. 
jumping out of an airplane with 110 pounds of battle equipment strapped to me with 900 guys filling the sky so full of parachutes that the sky went black and knowing that the least injury on any of those jumps was a broken leg and knowing that any one of us could die, never knowing when we were going to war, getting on these planes, because we'd always have these war exercises. And, you know, you, you didn't know. I mean, you get a call at three o'clock in the morning, red alert, you got to get in here right now. And you got to always have your shit packed, ready to go. I learned the secret though. <laughs> when they start handing out ammunition, if it's blanks, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I don't know if you know this, but I was actually getting on an aircraft to go to Grenada right when they called it off. Oh, I didn't know that. I was literally boarding the aircraft in full battle uniform, parachute, everything to go to Grenada because the 82nd Airborne Division was the first ones in there. And actually, the whole boxing team was already in there. The, all, the, all the guys in the boxing team were on the ground fighting and shooting at people and blowing shit up. And so it was just by the grace of God that it ended right. Literally, I was climbing on the airplane and all of a sudden they announced, guess what? They've got it under control. We don't have to go. And I'm like, yeah, the young man in me was, was like, well, shit, I did all this training. I wanted to go do something with it. And the other, the, the father in me said, thank God. Cause I don't know if I would have come home from this thing. So those were times that when I was racing stock cars and I was just like riding the edge of flying right the fuck off the track and hitting the trees and <laughs> destroying myself, racing motocross right on the edge of the very threshold of my capacity to hold on to the damn thing. You know, these times, like when you're really like looking death right in the eyes, that's when you really not only are alive, but you really grow. But then there's something else. Somebody that I really love and respect by the name of J.P. Sears, you might check out his videos, did a video on why we shouldn't give up our guns. And I'll tell you what, J.P., you did a little history lesson for me that I hadn't realized. I knew about some of those countries, but when you surveyed all the countries and what happened to them after they gave their guns up, I was like, that's might be one of the most important videos of that have ever been fucking published in the state of our nation. So I, I just say namaste to you. Uh, I love you. I'm proud of you. The work you're doing is uh, very important. It's very emotional for me because I've been with you since you were a young man and I saw your greatness early. And to see you giving everything to us, it's powerful. Oh. And, and you really made me realize that we have got to protect our sovereignty. And as much as I promised myself as a soldier when I left, I said, I don't want guns in my life anymore because I see how dangerous they are, but I also realized they're also very important. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the show, and I've got something great to share with you. I think you've all heard plenty in the news about zinc, but what you haven't heard about is Symbiotica's amazing new zinc complex which is all organic and a unique formulation. And so because Shervin's the expert and the formulator and the founder of Symbiotica, I brought him in to tell us about the zinc complex and when we know we should use it because of the symptoms we're having. So Shervin, how do we know we need this complex? You know, zinc, I'm a mineral guy. Yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> it's Thank like, God. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. I mean, minerals are the root foundation of thought, emotion, and we're actually being present in the physical body. Without minerals, nothing can happen. Vitamins can't operate. Functions in the body can't happen. Hormones can't be made. You know, minerals are everything. And zinc in particular is very unique. I mean, think about it. They dip steel in zinc to keep it from corroding and rusting. That's called yeah. galvanization, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so just think about what it's doing in the body. Zinc acts as a super antioxidant in the body from top 
to bottom. Yeah. If you're deficient in zinc, most likely you have low libido, mm-hmm. low energy, depression. You're not motivated. You might have flaky skin. Mm. You're probably not sleeping well. You're probably not metabolizing well. Zinc is so profound in the human body that it crosses almost every barrier in the body. What do I mean by that? It's in your saliva. Yeah. It's in your snot. Mm-hmm. It's in your piss. Yeah. It's in your sweat. It's everywhere. And why is that? Because the our bodies are designed to operate with good zinc in the body. So mm. this formula is powerful. The results that we're having, the testimonials we're having, and just take it from me, this might be the most powerful formula we have at Symbiotica, and that's saying a lot. We have three forms of zinc in here. Two of them are trademarked. We also have two forms of copper in here. Copper and zinc might displace each other. That's why we have to have the perfect ratios in there. Uh And then we also have selenium in there, Mm. which creates the trifecta of these three critical minerals that we're not getting in our foods. Most people aren't eating oysters every day. Mm. And sometimes you just want to be able to reach in your cabinet and grab one little capsule I highly recommend eating this with your largest meal of the day Mm. because it's that strong until your body acclimates to it. I'm very, very happy about how this turned out and the results that it's having for both men and women. Excellent. You know, I know that uh, selenium deficiency is linked to uh, heart heart problems, holes in the hearts, heart valve dysfunction. Cancers. Yeah. Diabetes. uh, New Zealand has a deficiency of selenium in their soil and they were having a lot of problems with heart problems in the sheep there. Yep. And they tracked it to selenium deficiency. And I've also known of people that needed selenium to heal their heart. So what a great combination. So if you want to get your zinc complex, go to symbiotica.com, C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. And as a Living 4D listener, use the code CHECK15 on checkout and get 15% off your zinc complex and any of Symbiotica's amazing products. So enjoy and please take care of yourself. We all need to get our hands together and make the world a better place right now. So if your zinc complex and your Symbiotica products help us do that, then that's a worthy investment. Lots of love. My picture perfect world, there wouldn't be guns. Like, you can do a lot of harm with guns. You can do a lot of good. A gun is just potential energy. And... But we live in a world, guns are an invention, like it or not. And we know um, a lot of evil people have guns. And as you mentioned, what I pointed out in the video on guns, you look at history. History will repeat itself if you allow it. You look at any country that's disarmed their population mass genocide follows. By the way, when they're doing genocide, they don't say, Hey, we're doing genocide now. Coming to get you. No, it's always like, well, fucking uh, for your protection, we're going to round up the Jews and for your protection, take this shot. Like the devil masquerades as an angel of light. So like, let's not be too literal with how we're looking for genocide, but it happens. And, you know, guns are a a symbol and it's in our country, again, like it or not, guns are a symbol of sovereignty. If you have that symbol, you have your sovereignty. You at least have the potential for your sovereignty. And what we've learned throughout world history, if you don't have the symbol of sovereignty, someone's probably already taken your sovereignty. You're a doormat at that point. For me, the the gun is a symbol that says, if you want to take my freedom, it won't be easy. Yeah, exactly. And I think if you have a spiritual understanding, you don't really fear death that much. I mean, granted, like if you put a gun to my head, I'm going under a fight or flight response. I'll be scared. So I'll have that superficial fear for sure. But as I sit here right now, I don't have a deep seated fear of death. I feel I've lived a good life. I've contributed. I want more. Yet if, if it was all taken away, I don't fear what's on the other side. Like, what if we found out like, oh, the other side's kind of like better than this. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but then to me, the idiocracy that just blows my mind, like dumbness is the most entertaining thing. It's <laughs> the idiocracy. It's sad, of, but entertaining. <laughs> the idiocracy of people saying, oh, those, those people with guns want to take our guns because guns are bad. We should give those people with guns our guns because they're telling (laughs) us guns are bad. And they, oh, they walk around with 
private armed security 24 seven. Well, that's, let's not really think about that, but guns are bad. Let's give those people with guns or guns, just the idiocracy. It's just mind boggling. Well, you know, I read an article about Bill Gates recently, maybe five months ago, and it highlighted the fact that he had hired a team of Navy SEALs that have now got their own private security system uh, company to protect him. And I'm like, well, that's a sign that he knows he's poking the dragon, (laughs) you know? Yeah, yeah, man. Just if you look at hypocrisy and you just, you know what not to believe if you know how to recognize hypocrisy. And, you know, people have, I think, a direct connection to truth, whether that's God, universe, great spirit, like any name you want to put on it. And that's following the feeling of your heart, your gut, your intuition. But it, I mean, as you know, it shows up physiologically. And, and when you see a guy with a gun, wants to take your guns, something feels off. Doesn't mean you have an actual clear picture of what their agenda is, but you know that feels off. Trust that. that that's, that's your direct connection to truth. Like, you know, we, we'd all want our children, if there's some kind of sexual predator masquerading as a, a friend, an ice cream man, and they try to take your child down the basement, we would all want our children to trust their gut feeling. I don't know what it is. Something doesn't feel right about this. I'm not going. We want that for our children and we got to fucking do that for ourselves. And, and I know you and I do. And yeah. I'm oh yeah. Some of the others. Yes. And, and you know what the scene that pops up in my mind as you were talking there is, it sounds just so much like a bank robbery, right? They walk in with their guns and they want to take everything you've got. And if you've got a gun, they want that. If you've got a phone, they want that. And, you know, the first thing they did was go after our phones, but instead of taking them, they just spy on you and they block you. And it's like, okay, you know, as weird and ugly as it is, it, it has pushed the fish out of the water of the unconscious, hasn't it? Yes. And, and I, I've really been paradoxically enjoying, you know, it was like a long time ago when this all started off, you said something funny to me. You said, well, every uh, Luke Skywalker needs a Darth Vader. So here we go. <laughs> Let's get into this thing. And Joseph Campbell, in his one of his lectures, he's talking about how people just kind of live average lives. And he says, put your head in the lion's mouth and go for it, for God's sakes. He says, don't just go lob the ball over the net. If you're going to play tennis, play to win. He is like, get into it, you know? And, and so it's, it's, for me, it's exciting to see so many people realizing, Hey, I've got to start taking care of my health. I've got to pay attention to what's going on. I've got to find alternative news sources. I've got to find doctors that are real doctors that don't just sell out and ignore the Hippocratic Oath. It's almost like, the, you know, when, when you till the land, you traumatize it, but it aerates the soil and the microorganism populations regenerate and you get more life out of it. And when cattle graze the land and when pigs work the land, some people think, oh, it's compressing the soil, it's traumatizing it, but Mother Nature knows exactly what she's doing. And I think that the sort of the funny side of all this, you know, if if there was no devil, there would be no free will. And it's almost as though the job of the devil is to make sure you have a choice because without a choice, you don't have free will. Without a choice, you don't have sovereignty. In fact, without a choice, you don't even have consciousness. You're just some kind of zombie blob existing and you don't even know it. So not that I condone evil at all, but I think that it is, um, well, I'll tell you something. I was in a deep meditation And I 
ask my soul to connect me directly to great spirit. And I said, why all the evil in the world? And this was during the pandemic. I said, why do you allow this? Why is this part of your being? I need to hear this from you. I don't want to read this out of a book. I need to hear it from you. I said, I know you can hear me. You created me. Everything that's here is you. There's nothing that cannot be here that is not of God or there is no God. And then we still have a problem because we're all here. So God's just a placeholder that says, we don't know where the fuck it all came from. But I know that whatever creates universes and has the wisdom to create a hundred trillion cells that work in harmony together as a human being has a level of intelligence that most of us can't even grasp. So I said to my soul, tell me when I'm connected directly to God. And I got a yes. And I said, God, why all the evil? And I got a very short answer. To uphold the good. Mm. And that's all I needed to hear. And it was like an arrow hitting me right in the head. Because without it, we wouldn't know what the good was. We would never know what was good. And so sometimes we just need a reminder. And there are people in the world that bring ugliness and pain and sadness and death. And those people, paradoxically, if God is unconditionally loving, are loved as much as the saints and and the sages and the goody two-shoes. And the reality of it is, is if we trust God, we have to have the spiritual courage to trust that all of this ultimately produces meaning and leads us to a deeper level of awareness and inspires us to grow and helps us get clear on what our values are and what we're willing to live for. And to loop back to what you shared a few minutes ago, Jesus in the Bible says a rich man can no sooner get to heaven than a a camel can fit through the eye of a needle. And what is he really saying? He's saying all you can take with you is what you've become. You can't take your money. You can't take your cars, your house. You can't even take pictures of your wife. You can only take what you've become. And the thing about the evil is it gives you a choice as to what you will become. Amen, man. And, and I think, do we become more and more live up to our true potential or do we look at evil? However, that shows up and cower away in fear and diminish ourselves and what we could be. And I think, uh, That's where we need the warrior spirit, where we have the courage to feel fear. Whether when we're dealing with evil, that can show up as simply as, oh my gosh, I might get disapproval from my friends and family if I share my real point of view about the vaccine. It's like, cool, you're either going to become more if you stick to your truth because you're looking evil in the face, or you're going to diminish yourself. So, Man, I I think evil with no meaning, that kind of makes our world a living hell through that perspective. But evil with meaning that you just outlined, that it just makes it make a lot more sense. It makes it much more of a exciting game that we get to live through. And also realizing like in the end, it doesn't matter. Like we're all... God, we all came from the same part, uh, the same place. So, yeah, I, I when I look at Klaus Schwab's actions, I need to remember there's a meaning to that. Not just like his meaning, his agenda, but like, oh, yeah, what's this mean for the awakening of humanity and the awakening for me as an individual? So anyway, I, I love your perspective you shared. Well, you know, the, 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 the other thing I would add to that, too, is that it's because of evil in the world that we each have times in our life where we get to decide what we represent. In other words, if somebody's abusing somebody, 
Like I saw a video recently that just upset me. It was somebody sat on a New York subway train. I think it was New York and watched this guy get on the train and start just really like abusing people. And he grabs this girl by the hair and just throws her down. And he starts just abusing the shit. And the poor girl was scared to fucking death. Uh, and, 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 you know, it was like hard to tell if he was going to kill her. He had his arm around her neck and he was just being out of control. And JP, you could see on the me. people were, they didn't even look Jesus. talking up, uh, texting on their phones. And this girl's screaming her head off. And this guy's like possibly going to kill her. And they were just completely ignoring this. And I, I said to the girls, I said, if I was on that train, you could set your stopwatch and I can promise you it would not get to 60 seconds before he was in a chokehold, put to sleep, tied up with his own stockings. He was wearing a woman's stockings. I said, I would have tied that son of a bitch up and waited for the cops to come collect him. I cannot fucking believe those people didn't do a damn thing about this. But my point is, Whenever we're in the presence of evil, we right then and there have to draw a line. And on that side is the evil, on this side is good, and we have got to decide what we're going to stand for. Right there. And, you know, a lot of people have a hard time distinguishing what's evil and what's not evil because a lot of it's a judgment call, right? Like a lot of people think circumcising your children is evil or some of the African tribal ritual rites, such as removing a girl's clitoris, which some tribes do, they think that's evil, but they don't realize that's their customs. There's a reason that the Jewish people circumcised. In fact, I looked into it. It turns out that circumcision comes from even before the Jewish people, but it was actually, this you'll find interesting, when they were training young men to be warriors, one of the tests of manhood was you had to get circumcised with no anesthetic, no alcohol, nothing, and you could not make a sound. And if you did, you were not ready to be a warrior. Why? Because in the battlefield, you can be in pain, but if you make a bunch of noise, you give your position away and you all get killed. Hmm. So the actual origins of circumcision that I found from my research was that it's an ancient tradition for initiating young boys into manhood. But the point I'm driving at is that good and evil is not only a cultural difference, but it's a personal difference. And what one, you know, some people think getting in a boxing ring is evil. So there's the relativity of it. But people say, well, how do you decide what's good and and what's evil? And, and, And I meditated on this because it's an important question. And so here's what I concluded, and I'd be interested to hear what you think of this. If what you're looking at and having a hard time distinguishing is good or evil, ask yourself, what would the world be like if everyone did what you're seeing happen right now? We can take something simple. If everyone threw their cigarette butts out the window, what would the world look like? And how much of it would burn down? If everybody just threw garbage on the ground and didn't use cans and have any respect for public spaces, what would the world look like? If everybody just kicked doors down and stole stuff and acted like pirates, what would the world look like? So I I personally came up with this little litmus test for evil. If everyone did what you're seeing happen right now and it would make the world a shittier place, it's some degree of evil. And if it would make the world a better place, it's some degree of good. The hard part is there's a lot of people that can't make that decision very effectively because a lot of people think throwing paper on the ground and shit is their freedom and yeah. they're right, right? So it, it does get tricky, but this is what where we've got this problem of a lack of common sense in the world today. And I think we have to go back to Pottinger's cats for that one. Well, you know, with evil... Uh- I love those perspectives and I, I really like that understanding the context that something's seen in like, cool. If you're not circumcised, you see someone circumcised, like, uh, like you can think that's evil. 
But then when you understand the situation, maybe it's very different. But it, it could be like if you're training someone in the gym, say you've got them under a, a squat bar, he's got 400 pounds on it, guy's filled with lactic acid, he's in immense pain, and you're there coaching them. Someone from some foreign indigenous culture could come see that and be like, well, that's fucking evil. Look at what he's doing to him. Yes. But when you understand the context, you realize, oh, that's not evil. They're participating with their own free will and there's you know, their freedoms aren't infringing on the freedoms of other people. Like the asshole who throws paper on the ground, like, well, that's infringing on other people, their planet, it's trash is going to blow into their yard. And, and one, one, how I tend to look at evil, uh, I like to define it as anytime you're trying to control another person in the way that's not in their best interest. Yes, I agree. And, and to me, Evil is all about control. It's contraction, and you you control through this correct contraction through fear, instilling fear into other people. Whereas, you know, for you know, good that being the opposite of evil, you call it drop one of the O's, call it God. God is all about freedom. Freedom expands, and it's not fear that expands; it's love that expands. So we all know when you're in a loving relationship, the more you try to control your partner, the less loved they feel. But the more you love your partner, the less controlled they feel. They feel honored and respected. So when I, you know, when I've analyzed all that's going on in the world, that's how I created that kind of functional definition for me, just seeing like, oh yeah, this is what they're doing is trying to control other people, their minds, their actions, their money, and the money. Absolutely. So, you know, when I see someone trying to control another person in a way that's not in their best interest, that's what I like to call evil. And, and then one of the other litmus tests, you know, when someone is trying to decipher, what's evil and what's not like, yeah, pay attention to your gut, your heart, like, cool. Understand the context of the situation. Like you mentioned, you know, is there controlled, whether it's subtle control propaganda or physical, is there control over another person? And like, how the fuck does that feel to you? Yeah. You know, if, if my house was on fire, I would run in it right now and save my son and my wife, like I'm literally controlling them but it's probably in a way that's in their best interest. Hi, everybody. Have you ever wondered why your blood is red? It's because it's full of oxygen and life force. It's what keeps you going. But what if I could tell you about something else that's red that will add more life force and keep you going? And if you start with a red juice before you have coffee or tea, and wait a few minutes, you might find that you either don't need the coffee or the tea, or you need less of it. But this time, instead of getting coffee and tea, you got a lot of nutrition and a lot of great stuff for stress management and detoxification. And it's so important. I got Drew Canole. It took me two years to get him to come <laughs> hang out with me and talk about this. I said, Drew, tell me more about your red juice. And he is right here to tell us what is on with your red juice. My kids love it. Everybody I know loves it. Well, I love that we have it for kids. Because yes. when I was a kid, there was this big red dude that would burst through a brick wall. And he was like, oh, yeah. And he would <laughs> feed me a glass of 50 grams of sugar, <laughs> giving most people diabetes, yeah. ADHD, yeah. addiction. Obesity. Obesity. All the things, right? Mm. So when we created red, it was, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. If we could create something that could create lasting stamina, lasting energy. And then we started to look at our ancient ancestors. Mm -hmm. We talk about the Vikings, mm -hmm. the people that were rowing across the oceans, oceans. for days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. to go to war. Yeah. What were they taking? Well, they were taking rhodiola. Yeah. Rhodiola is in our red juice. Yeah. And then we were like, okay, so out of all the mushrooms, yeah. what's one of the best medicinal mushrooms that can give us long lasting energy? Mm. We found cordyceps. Cordyceps mm. are absolutely amazing. Yes. Not just any cordyceps or rhodiola, glyphosate residue free and organic. Mm -hmm. And how can we make it taste better 
Then the, oh yeah. You yeah. know, how do we make it taste better than that without the sugar? Yeah. We added a little monk fruit. Monk we, fruit's amazing. Yep. And we found the best berries on the planet. Mm. Berries in, in high amounts, which we have in the red juice, actually help increase stem cell creation in your body. Mm. What's better than that for our little ones and for us? Yes. And so many people are just lethargic. They're lacking energy. Yes. What could we do for that? Red juice in the afternoon, 2 p.m. rolls around instead of a nap, instead of the coffee. Drink the red juice. You're going to feel so much better. Well, if you need the nap, take the nap if you can, but then take the red juice to kick you back into gear. Exactly. I love naps and I love coffee. I I do too, but I love to make sure I got the nutrition in me first. You know, the other thing is berries are a natural stimulant to the adrenal glands. So Mm. if people would do a little red juice before they do coffee and tea, they would pick themselves up naturally, except this time they're bringing in nutrition. And unfortunately, coffee blocks almost every vitamin and mineral you can put in your mouth. So- Hey, there you have it, right from the man himself. If you're ready to get red with life force energy and vitality, go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com. And to make it even better, use the code C-H-E-K-20, all caps, to get your 20% discount on checkout because you're a living 4D badass and we want you healthy. I love you. Bye-bye. Yes. And you know, you talk about finding yourself aligned with Christian values and moving in that direction on, on Tucker Carlson's show. So this inspires me to show you the spiritual opportunity that we all have in front of us. And this is another one that, you know, I'm still learning and growing into. And Jesus said, love thy enemy as thyself. And so I have to constantly look for the Klaus Schwab's, the George Soros. I got to find them in me yeah, and say, okay, where, where am I being greedy and controlling and uh, maybe focusing only on my self-interest or not sharing as much as I could? I don't know. You know, that's the real deep work of shadow work. And it's not an easy thing to do because most of us don't want to see the darkness inside of us. It's way easier to just project it out on the Klaus Schwab, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And so, you know, the the thing I'm bringing up here is, you know, a lot of people claim to be Christians, but, you know, I, I, I remember distinctly watching Christian soldiers during the Gulf War writing nasty notes to the Muslims they were bombing and signing Jesus to it and, and using Jesus as their reason to wipe people out, which has gone on forever, not only in Christianity, but in religions around the world. But the, I think the real, the real practice of Christianity includes loving the enemy as they self. And so the deeper question is, how do we make the changes necessary And have the empathy for people that are that lost, that confused, and that in a in in that deeply uh, state of psychopathy. Like, what do we do collectively to begin to recognize that these people are not the only people that have this mindset. They're not the only ones at all. In other words, you could get rid of Trudeau. You could get rid of, you could start getting rid of all these guys, but just like weeds in a garden, they'll just keep popping up until we balance the soil. And so I, I think from a Christian perspective, how do we love the enemy as ourselves? How would I want to be treated if I had reached a point where I was so unconscious, I was willing to kill millions of people and call it medicine or science and delude myself that bad. What would I want my buddy JP to say to me or do to help me? Would I want him to lock me up and talk sense into me? Would I want him to shoot me and say, that's the fastest route to God? You know, it becomes, this becomes deep spirituality. And I I think if you study the teachings of Jesus, it's very deep spirituality, and I think it's so deep that most Christians have no idea what Christianity really is. And and I'm just curious, what's your perspective from the statement that Jesus made, love thy enemy as thyself? How do we do that now? Yeah, I, I think it's a huge question. I'm not possibly qualified to answer, but here's some... <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I, I think we need to see ourselves in the enemy. And it's like the the best way to help Trudeau, the tyrant that he is, is not need him to reflect tyrancy to us. Because I one of the spiritual principles I value the most because it's so practical is other people what you see in other people and what you see in the mirror or what you see in the world is always a mirror showing you to yourself a lot of that is what you don't want to see about yourself so you think like oh i could never well he wouldn't be in your field you wouldn't be perceiving him the way you do if you didn't have something like that in you and we need to like quit thinking literally and be like well dude i'm not doing genocide so like i'm not klaus schwab <laughs> but you know well uh 2 years ago i started asking myself that question cuz covid hits all this censorship crap all over the internet and you know i was pissed off Typically, <laughs> I think when we're emotionally charged, that's the sign that we are really seeing ourselves in the mirror. Otherwise, <laughs> we probably wouldn't be emotionally charged. So I'm like, God damn it, what is it about me? So I realized, like, all right, like, I don't censor other people, but I censor myself more than anyone else can. And why am I so triggered by tyrants like Fauci and Trudeau? At times, I treat myself like a tyrant. You know, whether it's suppressing my authentic voice or like, dude, fuck that. I have to show up this way to get approval. So I I think we have the evil tyrants in the world because that's what parts of us vibrate at on the inside. So we need that mirror to show us what we haven't reconciled about in ourselves. So I think in a, in a, more abstract sense, like how we get rid of the tyrants in the world is we do the self work. So we don't need the tyrants in the world to show us the small tyrancy uh, that hides in our shadow. Like, yeah, I mean, most of us would say like, dude, I would, I could never hurt another person. I could never, you know, de deceive people the way these tyrants do. Yeah, probably not but you probably do that to yourself. Yes. And and there's the 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 origin of love is with the self. That's why you know I teach I we all. You can't love someone better than you can love yourself. And and um you know one of the things that a lot of people don't think about with regard to this is really what this boils down to in many ways is a clash of belief systems. Like Bill Gates, the, the whole Great Reset and World Economic Forum, they're part of a belief system, just like Hitler had Nazism. It's a belief system, like Rastafarianism, um, Buddhism. Isms are belief system. All religions are belief system. And belief systems, by definition, are closed for a very simple reason. How much Buddhism or Zoroasterism or Taoism can you put into Christianity before nobody knows what it is anymore? You know, like to be a soldier is a belief system and there's a code of conduct, a manual that says, this is who you kill. This is who you don't kill. This is what you do when you capture someone. This is what you don't do. I mean, I had to memorize the whole fucking manual. Right. So, but, but it's a belief system. Right. And so when we say, okay, we've got a clash of belief systems. We've got a scientific materialist belief system that's going against many other belief systems. And so love thy enemy as thyself. If it, 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 as you said, the mirror, we have to say, okay, where's my belief system exclusional? Where am I excluding others? You know, and it's like, an example is many times with my students over the many years of the Institute, I'd be sitting at a coffee shop or something and an obese person would walk by and somebody would say something. Oh, look at that fat fucker. I can't believe that. Like they were disgusted by that person. And I would say, first of all, can you imagine being in that body and how uncomfortable that must be? Second of all, having worked with a lot of obese people 
and seeing their entire medical case history, many of them have been to 30 or 40 doctors, followed exactly what they were told and got worse and have lost faith in any attempt to get better and are desperately lost because they don't know what to do. My point being is you see there's a belief system. If you're fat, there's something wrong with you. You're disrespectful, whatever. But they don't have the empathy to say, you know, what's really going on in that person's life? And, and of course, you know, a lot of being overweight comes from trauma, sexual trauma, and trying to hide themselves and a lot of things. But, but, but what I'm really saying here is when you look at the, the danger of a belief system, and Jung spoke about it extensively, and James Cars wrote a book, The Religious Case Against Belief, pointing out that if you have a belief system, you cannot truly be religious because you stop growing, you stop exploring. And belief systems are believed. Once you stop, start believing, you stop questioning, right? I mean, you don't question whether or not you can tie your shoe because you believe you know how to do it. So when we're looking at the problems in the world, we're looking at a clash of belief systems and a myth is a belief system, right? When you have a tribal myth, that's the way you relate to God, to nature, to your enemy. So we're actually, in my observation, we're in a mythical transition and though, whenever you're in a mythical transition, it, it always brings mayhem. Jung, Campbell, many others said that's how wars start, and that's when isms start popping up because all the people that haven't reached adult maturity are looking for a father figure to tell them what to do. And I think that's why Trump was so popular because he was kind of like the knight in shining armor for the sleeping children that wanted a tough daddy that would kick some ass for them. But anyhow, I just wanted to share that I think we, we don't want to forget that the mind is a very powerful thing, and that's where the home of a belief system is. It's the mind. Your heart doesn't have a belief system. It just loves. Your guts just do their best to digest whatever you put in there. Your body believes whatever your mind says. And I think that part of growing up means that you have to discern carefully. You're a father now. You have to discern more carefully how deeply you go into parties or how much of a dose you let someone give you in a plant medicine ceremony because you know you might not come back if the dose is too high. You've seen it happen, I'm sure. I mean, you know from, from your experiences of what I've experienced, and you know, we, we know someone who's had a few people disappear. Um, you have to discern how are you going to use your money, right? You, you, you have to really start thinking more deeply as a parent because you're carrying the responsibility of other lives. But when we wake up to what love really is, it's an inclusive level of consciousness. It's, if you want to call it, it's a force. It's a force of inclusion. And when belief systems become exclusional, then that's when they get labeled as evil by the people that are on a different belief system. So I think we're in a bit of a, a social melting pot right now. We're, we're all really trying to figure out what's true, what to believe. And part of the process is, is you got to start thinking. You have to actually <laughs> solve problems. You can't read. You know, Rumi said no man can get to God until he becomes a heretic. What is he saying? You can't have an experience of what God is reading a book. That was somebody else's ideas. You have to actually go out with the honest question and the honest interest of finding what the word God means and being open to the experience of it. And love is the fastest route there. So I think that we're at a time now where we, we have to really look carefully at what we believe, how we believe, why we believe, who we believe. And we have to look at what we believe of our own story, because a lot of times our own story is actually more tyrannical than the story that Bill Gates and a lot of these other guys are telling. And so love thy enemy as thyself actually has to start with love thyself and don't become thy enemy. Yeah, man. Amen to that.
Hi, you guys. I know you all know that super green powders are good for you if they're made from organic sources and they're processed properly. So the nutrients are there. And that's exactly what Paleo Valley does with their super greens powder. So I brought Autumn Smith in to tell us exactly how she created it and why and what it's going to do for you when you try their amazing organic super greens powder. Autumn, what is the magic you've got here? Well, like you said, we all need to get more of those micronutrients that you find in fresh fruits and vegetables. And so we've created a powder that you do not have to choke down. It has an absolutely delicious berry lemonade flavor. And the reason that it's different is because A, it is all organic, 23 organic superfood ingredients. And B, it is a very, very gut-friendly product because what I've found in my practice is that a lot of people don't do well with cereal grasses. And we know cereal grasses, like wheatgrass, can contain lectins that can be hard on the guts of a lot of people I work with. And so what we did was we created a a cereal grass-free alternative. We use high quality, the cleanest, highest quality spirulina on the market, raised in India. And then we added the 22 other organic fresh fruits and vegetables, and the flavor will surprise you. So all you have to do to check it out is go ahead to paleovalley.com. That's P-A-L-E-O-V-A-L-L-E-Y.com. And you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K-15, at checkout. My son drinks it every day. We call it his ninja juice, and I sincerely hope your family loves it as much as ours does. All right, everybody. Go paleo green and get rocking. Hope you love it. You mentioned before about beliefs, like having beliefs and believing beliefs. Ooh, that's a tough place to be. I think that's where we start to self-identify with what we think. And that's dangerous because that means we're probably not going to change what we think, even if what we think isn't serving us anymore. We're not going to change it because at some level we believe we'll perish if we change the beliefs that we self-identify with. But man, I, I think now more than ever, we need to do what you were just saying. We need to question what we think. We need to realize nothing is as it seems externally and certainly internally. And I I think celebrating changing our minds is such a great thing. And to me, having a, like a purpose of a belief is to then outgrow that belief and like adopt another belief, realize, cool, this is temporary. It's not the truth, but it's maybe better than what I held. And then get the next handhold and I, I've got so much room to grow on that. Yet on that journey, uh, I've um, after my comedy shows, when I'm out traveling doing those, I have um, VIP attendees. So after the comedy show and the general admission clears out, I come back on stage and do a Q and A with the VIP um, folks. And I think every single q and a I've had in the past few months, someone's brought up these videos I've been doing. They're not comedy videos, but they're videos where it's usually like, hey, uh, I was wrong about guns. Here's why I changed my mind. I've done a, a couple of those videos where all I do is share, here's what I used to believe. Here's what I believe now. Here's why I changed my mind. And there's nothing super insightful about them, but in every single um, session, someone brings that up and just says like, dude, that's not a comedy video, but that's one of the most powerful videos I've seen you do. Thank you for doing that. And aside from like taking the compliment, cool, feels good, dopamine hit, yay. But what that actually means to me is that's representative of the thirst in the inherent knowing that people have of how important it is for us to change our minds, let go of old beliefs, question things, question ourselves, because we're never going to grow if we don't do that. And if you look at all of our problems, personal and social, they're going to stay the same if our thinking stays the same. Yeah, it's it's time for all of us to grow up physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. I don't think the world can handle too much more childhood silliness, ignorance, hiding, not participating, 
avoiding discomfort, avoiding responsibility. Um, you know, we're really at a point where you either make a choice to become a factory farmed animal or to stand for freedom and create freedom and eat, sleep, breathe, and shit it. Yeah. And your, your words, it's your choice. That that's what everybody needs to know. Like, cool. It's your choice. Nobody's doing it to you. No, it's so in a way it's an exciting time because we really, we have to, I think, one of the problems with all the isolation and in all the segregation and the vaxxed unvaxxed is, is it's, it's taken away the Sangha, the, the gathering, you know, Gnosticism was Gnostics were people that got together usually at night, sat around campfires and shared the techniques that they had used to have spiritual or mystical experiences, ways of meditating, ways of perceiving things. And I think, that's real religion. It's like, you know, like you know, you and I have been doing this for our whole life together. We get together, we talk about this. You used to say, I learned this from John McMullen or I learned this from somebody else. And, and I would say, well, that's interesting. And what about this? And, you know, one time I gave you a bunch of shit cause you talked about you were feeling some shame about something and whatever. And I said, you know, I just tried to give you a different perspective on it. And, 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 you know, but, but you see, that's, to me, that's called open-mindedness. I built the entire Institute, not on a belief system, but on principles. I said, these are the things you've, you've got to know these things about somebody in order to identify what's actually causing their problem. I don't care what belief system you have. You know, people always say, what do you think of the Agoski method? What do you think of this method? And I'm like, Well, I can tell you 15 things they're not looking at, but the reality of it is, is I, my goal as a teacher was to teach people how to think, what do you need? What information do you need to gather? And I think the only way I've been successful as a therapist, as a teacher in my career is to constantly look for what I need to learn to be able to see more, hear more feel more, intuit more, understand more so that I can offer more because ultimately I know you will agree. I I think I can only speak for myself, but I think you're in alignment with me. I feel the most alive when I'm doing things that help other people. That's when I feel that I'm here to, I'm, I'm, I'm actually here on this planet to help other people. And I think any belief system that limits the number of people you can help is going to create resistance and it could become a form of evil. Amen. Uh, I very much agree with that. And you mentioned what you, it just strikes me and I want to share this, what you built the Institute on is principles. As I'm looking around at people and companies uh, whoever it is in our world today, I'm really recognizing principled people versus unprincipled people. And, you know, beliefs, they come and go, but principles are timeless. They don't erode away. And, you know, principles in another way, is, it's like, it's what you stand for. And we all know the old saying, it, if you stand for nothing, you'll fall for anything. But if (laughs) you know what you stand for, you're not going to fall for anything because you have your principles. You like the Christian churches you mentioned that are fucking selling out for $5 million. That is not a principled move. No. (laughs) A, a, you know, the, the, whatever it was like the 6% or 3% that said no to the money, we're going to stay open. That's principle. That is a principle. And you know, the statement, give me liberty or give me death. That's a principle. Like that's someone who, and I think principles, they're always linked to something greater than ourselves. Yes. You know, it, 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 what, it's a sense of contribution, whether it's to your family, community, country, students. 
But we know principles, they're real principles. It's not going to be all about you. That's called narcissism. You can have that as your principle if you want. But what, 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 one thing I think we, everybody would benefit massively from is asking themselves, what are my principles? I don't know. Now's a good time to fucking answer it. Yeah. And, and let values. yourself a hundred percent. Yeah. Because that becomes the North star. If you know what you stand for, you're not going to fall for propaganda because the propaganda comes in. You don't know if it's true or not. How's it stack up against your principles? If it's out of alignment, it's probably garbage. If it's in alignment, maybe it's helpful information. Yeah, I, I think the reason principles are so important is because if I look inside of myself and use my clairvoyant vision and hold the question, what is a principle? What shows up inside of me is a circle with arrows like bicycle spokes pointing to the center. And all the arrows point to the center. And why that is an important image for me, because in the study of biogeometry and sacred geometry, the center is always the center. If you take a hula hoop and throw it up in the air and spin it, there's an invisible center that's always the center. So if you take us and throw us into a topsy-turvy situation like COVID, your principles are always pointing to the center, no matter what direction you're flying. You always have something to guide you back to the center. And the center is the point that is paradoxically the most and least conditional. It's the most conditional because it's the, always the center, but it's the least conditional because when you're in the center, you realize that you're everywhere and everything. Because everything moves around a center. Every atom in the entire universe is spinning at just under the speed of light. So isn't that an interesting kind of paradox that when you're in the center, you're everywhere, but you're simultaneously somewhere. And because the center is dynamic, you can be flipping and flying, but without principles, you can't find your center. And with principles, you can find your center. So I, I think, you know, living a centered life is like living a balanced life. And to feel what we're choosing tells us when we're moving toward or away from the center. And I think that's really important. You know, I could talk to you till the cows come home. But I also know you got a kid and a wife to love and participate with, as do I. Well, our conversations, they could be many hours. And to me, it just goes by like that. Yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, any chance I can get together with you. And, and the beautiful thing is we get to share this with thousands of people. So if you want to know what it's been like for JP and Paul to hang out for 20 something years, this is exactly what it's like, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's always Very been much. like this, <laughs> except for Very the times much. I would come home exhausted, burnt out, frustrated, and have tears in my eyes that I wouldn't show to anybody but you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now, you know, I find it funny. Um, when I went on Tucker Carlson, they wanted pictures of you and I together because they know our work was a meaningful part of my story. And I had to message Penny. I'm like, fuck, do you have pictures of me and Paul? Cause we got together before there were cameras on every phone <laughs> and know. certainly not iPhones. So nowadays I guess we got more pictures and videos and the rest is stored in memory of the humankind. And it, 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 you know, because I was looking for pictures because Penny came to me and said, JP needs some pictures of you together. And I, and every picture I had was either me taking pictures of you exercising <laughs> or it was you in videos. So the yeah. only picture I had was me holding up your book with a picture of you on it. <laughs> and I said, I realized most of my time with JP was private. Like, you know, it was our morning meetings over espresso where we talked yeah. about the issues of our lives in the world. And, and like is, do you realize most of our meetings together where most people would take pictures 
you and I just were together alone and weren't interested in the pictures as much as we were interested in just being together. Yeah. Amen. And that, that's still what's important to me. I've almost never take pictures with people because it takes me out of the moment and uh, we didn't really have that option. It, but those meaningful times of connecting over espresso, like, cool, this isn't for other people seeing us together. This is just about being together. And that's yeah. kind of what matters most. And that's what we're doing right now. So thank you again for everything. And um, I can't wait to have a day when I can see your little guy and sh- and let you yeah. see Mana and Zoe now they're older. Cause, well, see, last time I was at your place, did we have Zoe that, that, at that time? No, Angie was very pregnant. Right. But yeah, well, I got to show born. you, I got to show you, it's a real powerful experience having a daughter. My God, it flips all yeah. sorts of switches in you, man. I bet it is different. And she knows how to get daddy wrapped right around her finger, man. I feel like I don't have to worry about Klaus Schwab controlling me. I got my daughter. (laughs) (laughs) She's a much more loving form of control. Yeah, yeah. It's fun to give in, you know. And she's always, daddy, can I have a gummy bear? (laughs) Can I have some gum? Can I have a cookie? (laughs) So anyhow. You know, too. Well, thank you for everything. And, um, if, before we say goodbye, where can people find you if they want to, uh, look into you, maybe for those that haven't watched any of your videos or where would you like to direct people? Yeah. You know, uh, the single best place, cause it's a hub for everything else. My website, awakenwithjp.com. you know, that's my YouTube and all the things are on there as well as some other goodies. So wakingwithjp.com is a good place to either avoid me at or find me at. <laughs> Go log on to awakenjp.com so you can avoid him. <laughs> exactly. I'm avoiding JP. Oh, what did he just say? <laughs> yeah, maybe we should. I should get another website of, yeah, avoiding JP or awaken with JP. Yeah, your choice. Your choice. <laughs> it's like people, people used to say to me all the time, because you know how I used to be in lectures. They'd say, God, don't you get nervous that you're pissing so many people off? And I say, no, I don't get nervous at all because I'm telling them the truth to the very yeah. best of my ability. And it doesn't matter if they love me or they hate me because I've gotten inside of them. And the more they hate me, the more they're going to talk about what I said. And eventually they're going to come across somebody and says, well, you know, he's actually telling you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, you can hate me for saying there's no such thing as the right diet all you want. You know, just pay attention and you'll learn or any number of things. So yeah, I, I get it. You awaken or avoid, but they both lead you to JP and you find JP right inside of you. <laughs> yeah. All wisdom is found within JP within inside of you. That's exactly. That's why I needed you in my life. Cause I wouldn't have found any wisdom without you. So thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome, brother. Well, thank you for having me on the show and thank you, Paul, for obviously you've massively, impacted my life. I mean, we didn't even scratch the surface in this podcast about the impact, but just thank you for all that you've done for me. And thank you for all that you give to the world and other people helping awaken them and teaching principles and helping empower people to live physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually much more well. Thank you. It's um, times like this and people like you that made the pain worth having of the journey. And uh, you've given me a lot to celebrate. So uh, I love you, partner. Yeah, I love you too. All right, man. Go give your wife and kid a hug for all of us, okay? I will do that. Same to you. You Hug those little ones for me. I will. Thanks, bud. See ya. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, JP Sears. You can listen to JP's own podcast, Awaken with JP, on all major podcast platforms. And you can find him on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Awaken with JP. Look for his tour dates for his comedy shows on his website, awakenwithjp.com. And there you can also find videos, merchandise, and much more. Follow Paul on Instagram at paul.check, on Twitter at paulcheck, or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash living4d with paulcheck. 
You can watch more on Paul's blog at paultexblog.com and get your free subscription to Czech videos and more at the Czech Institute's new media site, chekiva.com. You can read the show notes and find links to the resources mentioned in this episode at checkinstitute.com forward slash podcast. And finally, if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider leaving us a five-star rating and a warm review at the top of the show page on Spotify or at the bottom of the show page if you are listening on Apple Podcast.